Hello, today I'm going to be talking about some concepts from Chapter 9 of Maxfield and Babby. Chapter 9 is all about survey research. So what is a survey? And the most simple way to think about this is to think of a survey as a questionnaire that requires someone to answer questions about a particular topic. You've probably taken surveys before in the past, maybe in class or over email. I know the university is great about sending us emails and asking us to participate in various surveys. Overall, a survey is a good way to get people's opinions or attitudes about a topic that we're interested in. We see a lot of examples of surveys in criminology and criminal justice research. The National Crime Victimization Survey is a very common one, and this is the survey which asks people about uh, their victimization experiences, so if they've been a victim of a, of a crime in the last six months. We also see uh, a lot of self-report surveys where people are asked to self-report the number of times they've used drugs or the number of times they've uh, committed uh, certain criminal offenses. We see uh, surveys of criminal justice officials. Just to give you some examples from my own research, um, my thesis was based on survey data that had been collected from a sample of police departments all over the United States. And my thesis chair, uh, what she did for this project is she actually sent a mail survey to over a thousand police departments all over the United States. And the mailing contained two questionnaires. One was intended for the crime analyst and one was intended for the patrol commander. And the questionnaires just had a number of questions about uh, how their agency used crime analysis products and patrol work. And uh, so this was an example of using a mail-based survey and here the organization was the unit of analysis. In my dissertation research, I'm doing a similar study, but I'm using the individual unit of analysis. So I'm going to be giving a questionnaire to police officers, asking them to uh, assess the importance of different innovations in their work. So uh, their feelings about community policing, problem-oriented policing, crime analysis, and I'm going to be asking them how they feel these innovations work, if they feel these innovations are effective in reducing crime and improving police and community relations. But I'm giving this survey to police officers in two agencies, and so this is the individual unit of analysis. Um, so we see the use of surveys under many different contexts um, and used for different purposes in, in criminal justice and criminology research and also uh, with different units of analysis. So surveys contain different types of questions um, such as open-ended and closed-ended questions. An open-ended question allows the person taking the survey or the respondent to answer the question however they choose. A closed-ended question has fixed answers that the uh, respondent has to select. So you might see a question and then uh, a list of response options from like A, B, C, and D, and the person has to select the one that best matches their uh, opinion on the issue. Surveys also include statements. So we might see a statement and then we're asked to rate our level of agreement with the statement. You've probably seen this before. So you'll have a scale where you have to rate whether you uh, strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, and so on. The main challenge to survey research is writing good questions. And writing a good survey can be an art form in and of itself. Um, and the reason this is so difficult is because we know that people tend to interpret things differently. And we all have our own different uh, worldviews and perspectives on, on the world. And so when we write questions, we want our questions to be applicable to everybody. So everyone should be able to read our questions, understand exactly what it is that we're asking for, and then be able to give us that information. And that is um, more difficult than it sounds. 
okay? If we're giving a survey to 500 people, we want all 500 people to be able to read those survey questions and understand them and be able to answer them in the same way. And so you can see that that might be challenging because again, we all tend to interpret things differently. And so if you have questions on your survey that are vague or ambiguous um, or that are just not uh, written clearly, then people will have to interpret them and they're free to interpret them however they want. And so then you may get, um, you know, incomplete answers or, or poor answers. You know, people will try their best to answer the question, but uh, they won't be able to if they don't understand what it is that you're asking. So uh, writing questions can be very difficult. So uh, the chapter talks about these different survey administration techniques. Um, so there are self-administered surveys, uh, there are in-person interviews, and then there are telephone surveys. So self-administered surveys, mail surveys are probably the most common uh, method here. And this is simply when a survey is sent out via the mail and a person receives it in their mailbox and they have to answer the questions and then send the survey back. And usually there's a self-addressed stamped envelope so the person isn't sending it back on their own dime. Uh, we see self-administered surveys given at group events. Uh, for instance, in my dissertation research, I'm going to be administering my surveys to officers during roll call because that's a great time to get all the officers together. So I'll be giving them a paper survey at roll call. Uh, we also see a number of computer-based methods. So surveys can be disseminated via email or you could have a survey on a website and people have to go to the site and answer the questions. Um, the obvious drawback to these various uh, self-administered techniques is just simply non-response. So if you send out a mail survey, a lot of people are just going to throw it away and not respond to it. Um, email surveys have a similar problem in that they're just very easy to delete or they might end up in the person's uh, junk mail folder and then the person doesn't even see them. Uh, also another problem that we see here is people not completing the entire survey or, or not completing it correctly. Uh, just to give you a, a somewhat humorous example from my own research, several years ago I did a, uh, an email survey of correctional officers and one of my questions was how old are you? And this was just simply asked so I could get a sense of the age of my respondents and I had some joker write in there old enough. So I had to throw out um, you know, that particular person's survey because I, I didn't know how old they were. And that was a key question. Uh, so some other administration techniques we can touch on briefly, in-person interviews. This is when we actually send a person out to administer the survey and to ask questions of our respondents in person. Uh, this is better about getting a response because I think that people in general just would feel bad uh, rejecting someone. You know, it's a lot harder to reject someone that shows up at your door uh, asking to, uh, you know, if they could have some of your time to ask questions versus, uh, you know, getting something in the mail or over email. Those are easy to ignore. Uh, the major drawback here is that it's very expensive because you have to train and, and pay uh, interviewers to go out and ask questions. And also honesty. So people may not feel comfortable talking to an interviewer face to face, especially if you're asking sensitive questions like about uh, victimization or, you know, if you're asking someone to self-report on uh, their own drug use or criminal offenses that they've committed. And finally, the book discusses telephone surveys. This is pretty straightforward. It's just you have a call center, you have people just on the phone calling people up and, and asking them to complete the survey over the phone. Um, this is a good way to uh, ask questions in a uniform manner. It's a good way to get a lot of data very quickly. Uh, the problem is that this is limited to people who own phones. Another problem that we've seen uh, in more recent years is that a lot of people are getting rid of their landlines and switching to cell phones. And if you are using a cell phone, there's a good chance that uh, the area code doesn't necessarily correspond uh, to the location where you live. So I can use myself as an example here. Um, I moved to Orlando 
Um, I use a cell phone primarily. I don't have a landline, um, but my area code is the area code of my hometown. So if someone was trying to get opinions from Orlando citizens, um, they would probably miss me in a telephone survey because I don't have an Orlando area code. I consider myself an Orlando citizen, and for the purposes of research, I probably would be, but I would be missed by um, that, that particular telephone survey. So this can be a problem. Uh, overall, there is no perfect survey administration technique. Uh, I would say the, the perfect technique is the one that works for your study and that answers your research questions. And overall, there's pluses and minuses to each of these techniques. So you, you have to really just consider what's going to work best for your study. You have to keep your budget in mind. Uh, you have to keep in mind response rates, um, you know, what response rates are going to be acceptable to you. Uh, male surveys tend to have really low response rates, okay? So, you know, you have to kind of balance that and consider, do you really want to do a male survey and get, uh, you know, a low level of response? Uh, and this can be important if you're doing quantitative research. Um, you know, if you need a certain threshold of statistical power, you'll know what response rates are going to be um, appropriate and what response rates won't. So you want to keep this in mind. Uh, also, you want to keep in mind honesty of responses, um, you know, and how honest are people going to be in filling out your survey. Um, probably a self-administered survey would be better for more personal questions. So if you're asking people questions about, you know, victimization experiences or, uh, or to self-report on offending, you know, self-report survey is probably going to be a better option than um, a telephone survey or an in-person survey. So again, uh, pluses and minuses to each technique, pros and cons, you just have to weigh them and consider your study goals and what survey technique is going to work best for you uh, if you're using a survey. So that pretty much wraps it up for our discussion of surveys. If you have any questions about this, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email and I would be happy to address them.